All right. Seems like we can uh, we can start. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the to this session. Today we we will speak on the mechanics of a price change. This session um, follows a previous session we did last year, if I remember right, in November, where we talked about the structural aspects of um, of the OTC forex market. We talked about how the different market participants are organized. We, we identified them. We talked about also about the number or the types of orders used in the market. So in in this in this session now it's um, it's follow up of the previous session where we will enter a little bit more in detail of the micro structural aspects of price change. We will. By means of an idealized model, we'll try to explain why and how new prices change in the forex market. And we will do this uh, with a very simple and idealized model in order to understand things that a priori uh, may seem very simple, too simple to dedicate uh, a little bit of time to study them, but um, which, in fact, by um, Going a little bit uh, deeply into into this aspect, we may discover a, a new world of uh, inefficiencies to exploit in this in this market. We may also understand, and this is the the aim of uh, this session. We we may also understand that behind certain patterns, uh, we which we constantly see on our price charts, there is. Um, an explanation which has uh, little to do with mass psychology, which is usually um, what is used to explain why prices move. Um, and instead of that, we have an explanation which is much more objective, much more um, simpler to, to understand um, with all its complexities, but objective in the sense that we are um, explaining price change purely based on, on mechanics, so there is really um, not so much room for, for interpretation. Prices may change, and uh, all price action uh, uh, may change due to a vast array of, uh, uh, of, um, of inputs, of, uh, of aspects, of variables that uh, impact price. Most of the time we explain them through um, explanations or theories based on mass psychology, right? Um, a lot of uh, intraday patterns or, or short-term short -term patterns, uh, for instance, let's take um, candlestick patterns, are explained uh, by means of uh, buyers and sellers, bulls and bears, imposing their, their willingness upon the, upon the others and, and, uh, and winning uh, winning the battle, uh, which is led on uh, in the in the market, but um, this is is a nice way to to convey things, but um, not only not not always the best uh, the best uh, way to understand the price change, especially if we are dealing with the intraday, with a very short time uh, frames where this psychology may not play. Uh, such a such a big role, okay. So if there are, let's say, cultural, social, and uh, psychological aspects that, which would explain uh, price action, there are also structural aspects which have to do has to do with the uh, uh, with the way the market is designed, the way the orders flow in the market. Uh, the way that these orders are matched, um, it has to do with things like volume, with liquidity, and these are facts uh, which we cannot deny and which also affect price change. So we will, uh, by means of this session, we will uh, go one step, one step further in, into uh, this area, 
uh, I can announce from the beginning that we will not obviously uh, have the time to exploit uh, what I've mentioned as price inefficiencies. Um, the time is not there to do it in one session, uh, nor uh, is the uh, is the basics uh, covered, at least from my part, for us to, to enter into such a domain. But uh, at least we will we will create the the the, uh, the, the ground to uh, go into the more um, the more specific, the more practical side of uh, of exploiting uh, price inefficiencies. And uh, by the way, this part will be will be covered uh, uh, um, in a in a in a premium session in the in the next uh, in the next week. Nevertheless, I encourage you to to stay for. Uh, for the next minutes and listen uh, to to this session, which uh, I think can be of uh, your interest if you if you are trading the the forex market. Okay, in order to to start, um, we'll, I would like to uh, to mention that uh, the ideas explained here are based on the on the work of uh, of three authors. Uh, in this case, uh, Beeman Goldschmidt. Uh, with Art of Flow Trading, a book called Art of Flow Trading, Richard Olsen, a uh, small booklet, which we can, can also download from uh, from our educational section, which is called How to How to Trade, and also Beat the Forex Market by Augustine Silvani. Uh, there are more authors covering uh, this, um, uh, this uh, topic, which uh, I could add to the list, but at least for uh, the material that we will cover in this session, these are perhaps the the authors that most influence this uh, uh, this, this material. Okay. Fine. So let's start with the with a fair price. Explaining what is the fair price. And um, in order to do this, we would um, have to time to time travel, uh, travel in time back uh, in time, or um, at least down in history to to a time where any deal uh, between two parts wouldn't involve modern technology such as we have today, like uh, mobile, internet, email, phone, etc. Um, we would have to travel to a time where, in order to establish a price, um, a deal would have to be made face to face between two two parts, let's say, and in fact. Um, we don't have to, to time travel. Uh, we can travel in, in space, but don't, don't need to travel in, in time. Pictures you are, you are seeing here, um, this is something that I could uh, witness uh, this uh, summer on the west coast in, uh, in Portugal, on the Atlantic coast. And uh, it's, uh, it's a, a, what we see here is a traditional uh, fisherman uh, Day to, today, uh, practice of uh, going out to the sea and uh, bringing fish to the to the coast and, uh, and selling the fish directly uh, to to the people on the on the beach. And um, this involves an uh, interesting aspect of um, of, uh, of price fixing. Um, <clears throat> if you see here. Uh, these boats go go out to the sea. There are several boats of these along the along the coast. And when such a boat arrives, you see a lot of people uh, going to to meet the the fishermen. They help the to to bring the the net to the to the wet sand, and they they open the the net and start immediately the pacifying the the fish in the, in small boxes, which can be directly sold there on spot. And uh, many of the people involved here are just people that um, uh, want to um, uh, participate, that want to, to help. Through uh, the helping, you can profit a little bit. If there is some fish that falls out of the net, you can collect it and take it, uh, bring it home. And um, um, if you want to buy it directly there, you have this face-to-face -face negotiation with, uh, with the fisherman, they establish the price, and you can take the, the box uh, of fish uh, home or to your restaurant or whatever. But um, although it's practical uh, in the sense that uh, at least the, from, from the uh, qualitative side, it's very 
is very good because you get the, the fish uh, really really fresh from the from the net from the sea. Um, the impracticalities of it is that you cannot easily compare prices. If you want to compare a price from one boat to the other, not all boats arrive at the same time to the coast, so you have to walk and uh, you have to deal with uh, with a different uh, with a different fisherman, and uh, obviously you lose a lot of time, uh, and also uh, you have to to, co- to to recover a lot of space. So you need time and space in order to to make these uh, to make this deal. So it's it's uh, perhaps uh, not the most efficient way to do. Uh, to to find to find the 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 best price, but at least we get this notion: what what is the fair price? The fair price uh, is is that price that at that moment uh, that you negotiate with uh, with the fisherman. Okay, and that will depend obviously on the quantity of fish it's bringing, on the quality of it, how many people are there wanting to buy the same fish, and so on and so on. Aspects that we will see. Uh, that are uh, also playing a role in uh, in financial in financial markets. So, uh, in order to solve uh, the, the problem of distance and time, there is the creation of a market. Uh, so, creating a market is offers an answer to that question: how to solve the the fact that uh, I want to find the best price without having to walk from boat to boat. And spending so so much time, so the creation of a market will put all this the the fish under the same roof, all the the fishermen uh, selling at the same time in uh, at the same uh, at the same place. And here you see on the left side you have the sellers um, uh, selling their their selling prices, their their offer prices. And on the right side, you have the the buyers. Okay, you have the buyers uh, bidding their their best uh, their best price. They are the be- the price they are willing to willing to pay. Okay, but obviously um, there are there are newcomers to this to this market. Okay, like the guy here on the bottom, we see uh, scratching his uh, his head. This is, this man is probably a newcomer. The market it says, okay, that's fine. I, I have all uh, all sellers organized under a same rule. All buyers are here, um, but still I cannot 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 have uh, an idea of who is offering uh, who is offering the best price. Really, so shop, shopping for the best uh, price um, would be uh, the next question. Uh, once you create a market, you want to find what is the best available price? Okay, so this guy um, probably um, has um, an offer to to make a proposal to make for the uh, to all the sellers in the market, and uh, and he says, okay, um, in order to have an idea how the how how the prices um, what kind of prices are being displayed in the market, I would like um, that all sellers um, line up uh, in one in one queue, um, shouting their prices or announcing their, their prices from the lowest to the highest price. So I can see who is offering the lowest price for the fish, and uh, so I can I can have, have an idea of uh, who is offering what and how much. Right. The sellers initially may be a little bit. Uh, Resilient to to organize themselves in such a way because this would uh, put in evidence who is offering the best uh, the best price and who um, has the least least advantageous price. So they they ask the buyers to do the same. Okay, we are going to organize ourselves and uh, and uh, put put our prices in uh, in in a sequence. We ask buyers to organize the same way. We want to see from the buyers who is offering the highest, the highest bid, right? So we can uh, we can uh, uh, easily see 
uh, what is your limit? What is the, the the highest price you are as as buyers, which you are able to pay? So they organize they organize the prices in such a way that immediately we can see that the highest uh, uh, bidder, the highest uh, buyer, is uh, is wanting uh, or is is uh, willing to to pay 163 for for the for the fish in this case, and the the best um, or the lowest offer from the from the sellers is at uh, 164. So immediately we have we have this um, the, the what would be the the, the the fair price or the the current the current price somewhere in between the 64 and 63. Okay, so let's put it like 63, 63, uh, five would be the the current the current price. Okay. So um, shopping for the best price answers um, and organizing uh, organizing the information. The price information in such a way um, really also organizes the the, the the bids and offers and enables us to see uh, everyone at their limit, uh, the, the the buyers at their limit, um, where is the highest price they are willing to pay, and the and the sellers also at their limit, uh, the lowest price they uh, they are w- willing to sell. To sell their their product. Okay. Uh, by the way, the, the background image we see here is not a, a, a trading floor at a, at UBS, but a, a a fish market. Okay, an organized fish market. We we may find some some similarities between between one and the other. And in fact, there are there are a lot of similarities, which are which are interesting for us to 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 analyze. Here comes the um, another another concept, which is uh, the the volume. So, if uh, if price can be at whatever a buyer and seller agree it should be at, uh, price starts to move. Okay, so price change when participants uh, execute orders. But the question is, what happens if the quantity which is being offered at a certain price is consumed, right? Imagine, imagine that the seller offering the fish at 164 runs out of stock. He runs out of he or she runs out of stock, or for whatever reason, he uh, is not more, is not anymore is not anymore available uh, in the marketplace. So that price is. Um, is erased from the list. There is no more fish to be sold at 164. Immediately, what happens is that the next, the next uh, um, available offer price, 165, becomes the best available offer price, right? Because there was initially a seller lined up at 165, so that that is why we have the price. Here and now, there was seller. We don't know how much uh, there is to to sell, but at least there was something. So, so this is the next um, available uh, offer price, right? And what happens with the with the buyers is that the newcomers to the to the market they say, well, I don't care if if there is no no fish uh, to be sold at 164 because we saw fish being sold. At 164. So, our our best bid, our best buy price is that which we saw being negotiated. So we put our best bid at 164, and immediately we see how prices switched. Right from 160, 63, 64, they advanced, they advanced one um, one position higher to 65. 64. Okay, so we start seeing how prices move. They move because the the stock which was was available at one price is observed. It's observed, and immediately price has to move 
to the next uh, to the next uh, available price. So, to say. Okay. so this opens the question of what happens with incoming incoming orders. Okay. Price can be like we said at whatever a buyer and seller agree to be, but that only truly applies when those two, the buyer and the seller, are practically the only participants. Once the market expands and there is a general consensus on price paid on the best bid versus the best offer, price is now dictated by what happens with the incoming orders. This is what we are going to see through a um, simplified model of, uh, of liquidity. In order to understand how uh, prices are created, and here we go a little bit beyond the traditional market and start thinking in terms of a financial market. In order to understand um, how prices move, we have to count also with what happens with the with the liquidity. Okay, so we need a third participant, not only not anymore a buyer and a seller. We need at least three people, and we will make a very simplified um, model here to to explain price change. And we will use three fictitious um, uh, traders. One is Frank in the middle. And we have Joanna and Ingrid. And uh, Frank is, is a trader which, um, who thinks that um, the, the price, the current price, uh, should be at 1.7. We are still dealing with the same uh, price list, which uh, we have here. Okay. So Frank... Uh, is uh, for him the current the current price is uh, is below what uh, uh, his expected his expectations of value are and he uh, expects uh, the mar the market to be priced at uh, at 170 so he um, is is finding uh, a buying opportunity of an undervalued market which could be uh, in the future um, quoting a lot higher then we have uh, Joanna, uh, who thinks that uh, 1645 is a is a fair pr price? 1645 is right in between the bid and the and the ask, which we have right now. For Joanna, the current price is okay. It thinks that uh, price corresponds to to current value, and uh, and she doesn't see uh, a need. Um, or an opportunity to to enter the market right now. And then we have Ingrid, a third market participant, who at this stage has uh, no opinion yet about price and value. Okay. So in a conversation with uh, with Joanna, Frank, um, who wants to buy 75 contracts right now, and liquidate them at uh, 170. Uh, in a conversation with Joanna, uh, she agrees to sell to Frank 50 contracts at 165 and puts a limit order at 64, expecting to find a buyer. She is effectively creating a market. So, what what are we saying here? We are introducing here a number, the number of contracts. Okay. We are introducing quantity or uh, liquidity, okay? So, um, and we will see how this how this liquidity is going to be um, to be observed through the the transaction of the, the participant. Joanna, who uh, thought that current price are uh, acceptable, agrees to sell. 50 contracts to, to Frank at 165. On our price list, 165, okay, is uh, right above, right above what would be the, the the current price, which Joanna thinks is uh, a fair price, which would be 64.5, right? 64.5 is for Joanna the fair price. 65 is a little a little bit higher, so. She accepts to sell a little bit higher because she thinks, well, if, if, I'm, if, if I have to deal, 
uh, I have to, to have an opportunity, right? So we're not, we're not by yourself at what I consider to be the current price, but I will sell a little bit higher and buy a little bit lower, right? I will capitalize on this uh, price movement around what I, uh, esti- uh, what I estimate as the, uh, the, current, the current value or what I see is the current value, okay? So effectively, she's creating, she's creating market, right? She's offering uh, at 64 and asking uh, uh, for a buyer at, uh, at, at 65, okay? Also, uh, we noticed that she agrees to sell only 50 contracts, whereas Fran wants to buy 75. Okay, so she, uh, so Fran has still uh, another 25 to um, um, to find a seller. Okay, but let's see how uh, with within this idealized model how the prices change here. Okay, so we see that 165. We are still using the same uh, the same prices, okay? But we forget now that we have been uh, adopting these prices from from the fish market example. We we think now in terms of a, of a um, financial market. So Frank was the one who um, was wanting to buy. So he had to to find sellers, right? And Joanna agrees to sell 50 contracts. At 65, okay. Um, she was in our simplified model here, the only one who uh, was wa- willing to sell at 165. So all the contracts that were were uh, being sold at 165 are um, observed by this transaction between Fran and uh, and Joanna. So we have to erase the 165 because all the liquidity being offered at this level is erased. So what happens is that price starts to move up, starts to move up. And now the question is, where will the asked price, where will the asked price now uh, be uh, uh, fixed? What is the, the next ask price? And the answer would be, well, the asked price would go up at infinitum until uh, until um, we can find at some level a seller, right? Otherwise, otherwise the ask price will be just uh, um, uh, moving higher. In the previous example with the fish market, we had we had uh, a, a, a seller uh, at each price, but right now we have only these three participants: Frank, Joanna, and Ingrid, and uh, we have right now no seller at 63, 67, 68, no seller. This, this would imply that the ask price would go up at infinitum. At infinitum. Right? On the other hand, we have those, um, those 50, uh, 50 contracts on the bid side, right? On the, on the bid side, um, from, uh, from Joanna expecting a, uh, a buy. Okay. Now, Frank can still. Uh, okay. Frank can still make uh, a profit starting to 170. Okay. And this is um, is because Ingrid places a sell order. For 50 contracts at 168, Ingrid, um, she's she sees that price starts to move up, okay, and she may think, we don't know, it's not uh, of our interest here, the reasons why she uh, enters the market with a sell order, but she enters an order of 50 contracts at 168. At 168, she expects this movement to halt and reverse, right? She thinks that um, 168 would be uh, a price which is beyond uh, the the current value, and uh, she's wanting to capitalize on a a a move to lower prices, 
starting from 168. So she um, sees here in the, in the initial price movement created between Frank and Joanna, she de detects an opportunity and puts a sell order for 50 contracts at 68. And 60, 168 becomes the best offer, the best ask price, right? And here we start um, talking about something that we would could say that is liquidity disequilibrium. And this means when um, different quantities are being um, are being uh, um, offered on the ask and on the uh, and on the bid on the bid side. The price movement, which we have seen before, halted at least the ask price halted at 168, and is now um, and there are now 25 contracts being um, being sold there. Why? Because we had Ingrid wanting to sell 50 contracts at that level, and the buyer, the only buyer we had in this model, was Frank, which found a seller with Joanna for 50 contracts. So he still had another 25 contracts okay, uh, to find a, a seller, and he found Ingrid at 168. For Frank, like we said, there is still an opportunity to make gain because he aims at 170. So for him, he has a different time horizon than Ingrid and then Joanna. So for him, there is uh, still a potential to go to 170. And uh, part of his uh, of his um, of his uh, uh, of his bid is uh, is observed by Ingrid's order. So we can erase the prices of 65, 66, 67. We had nothing at 66, 67. There were there was no no seller. So these prices uh, are erased. And 168 is partially erased. 25 which are observed and the other 25 which remain remain in the uh, in the market okay so now we have these um, first we have a gap here between the us and uh, the bid created by this lack of liquidity at certain levels the lack of liquidity at 66 at 67 which created uh, this movement uh, towards the 168. And then um, we have also this imbalance between the, the buyers and the seller, okay? And the rule here is, which um, 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 we can say is, is a rule that applies um, always in, in the market, is that the probability of a price movement in such an equilibrium is always um, in, inverse to the distribution of liquidity means there is a higher probability for, for the prices to move higher than it is to move lower if there is less liquidity on the ask price. The reason is simply because it is easier to observe 25 uh, contracts than it is to observe 50 contracts. Okay, so the probability of prices going higher from this situation, which we have right now in this very simplified model, the probability of prices moving higher is higher than moving lower. Okay. Um, I hope that until now that things are more or less um, clear how, um, how prices move with this simplified model. If there is uh, any questions, please Please uh, go ahead during the session. You may you may start to 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 ask uh, your question. Is there anything which has hasn't been uh, fully understood? Because uh, these things uh, initially um, will will enable us to understand better things like support and resistance, why certain price patterns happen at certain market levels, and, and so on.
there is no question we we can um, we can move on and we will study now the impact of big order we have we have this order from Frank which caused this this gap in uh, between the bid and ask and um, the, the 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 impact of big orders is of interest for us because liquidity is never um, uh, it's, it's not always the same in the market. Um, liquidity is something uh, like volume that is fluctuating. There are moments of high liquidity, moments of low liquidity, and the impact of, um, of orders, especially big big orders, is something um, that we constantly see in, uh, uh, on our in our price chart. Right? In our previous session where we talked about the this structural aspect of uh, uh, of the OTC X market, we also discover that the the liquidity numbers, which are um, usually uh, mentioned when uh, when when speaking about the the size of the of the FX market, how how uh, tricky it is to um, to use those numbers, um, because uh, I will summarize here very very simple what we said in that in that session, which is if you if you take that huge apparently huge liquidity and you uh, really uh, dis- start dissecting all the the types of the types of orders that give uh, way to to that uh, to that accounting of, of uh, I don't know it's like Right now, from the last uh, uh, Bank of International Settlements, I think we are five trillion average uh, average per day uh, in transaction volume. But if we if we try if if we go ahead and 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 see really uh, that the part of that liquidity which is uh, capable of moving prices, um, we probably land with one third of, uh, of of that liquidity, and then. Still, we, we, this is an average average price for the entire FX, FX market. So we would have to, to dissect uh, not only in different currencies, but also think that those numbers are, are based on a 24-hour average. So, but on our intraday movements, which we see on our charts, this daily average is, um, uh, has to be Brought down to a smaller number, so we would have to divide, divide this number through 24 hours, and then this 24 hours through 60 minutes, and still you are having an average per minute. Or in a minute, a lot of orders can be executed. So if you divide this volume number, this turnover uh, through uh, 60 seconds, and and then you divide by all pairs. In, uh, in, in, the, in the in the correspondence uh, the correspondence uh, 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 amount, and then you divide by sellers and buyers. You you realize that you don't you really don't need that much liquidity to move this market, right? That is the the say the, the conclusion that we derive from those average numbers. Okay? So w- when we talk about the impact of big, big orders. We don't have to think about extraordinary orders, but orders of that which are uh, simply happening uh, all day long. Okay, fine. So um, uh, let me see if there are any questions. Can you can you share it a bit? Of, well, I think it's a bit of humor. <laughs> Being shared here, which is also is also fine. Yeah, liquidity has to be has to, uh, related to uh, to the fee. So um, in, uh, it was not done on purpose, but I guess is uh, is uh, can be can be seen uh, in, in, in such a way as well. So what we have here is um, is a, a logical uh, dispersion of the different types of buying and, and selling interest. We stay with the same price uh, uh, scale and the same current price which was uh, between 60 
far as 65. And here we have all the pending orders, uh, means all the, the limit orders uh, to sell above current price and buy be, uh, below current price. Those pending orders, um, we can we think back in the in the fish market uh, example where simply the people uh, uh, there uh, shouting their prices say I, I sell for this price or I would buy that price this is my limit all these are the uh, the limit orders which we constantly uh, insert on our trading platforms so um, here we see what we explained in the, in the last session that um, these limit orders offer liquidity to the market. Okay, and this is an important point. Limit orders are offering liquidity. Then we have the the, the latent interest, which are those those orders which are not yet placed in the in the market uh, because price is um, far from those from those levels. Uh, latent interest will uh, will change in the pending order as the price approaches that level. Traders will start to program their orders onto their their platforms. Uh, if there is enough time, they may use pending orders. If the market moves uh, very fast, they may choose a a market order for immediacy. Okay. And immediacy was. Um, was in our example what Frank, our our trader, did. He wanted to trade now, so he wanted immediacy, and uh, he uh, was placing a buy market order. Right, and Joanna and Ingrid, they were willing to transact at different prices using pending pending order, and that is how. The, uh, the liquidity that Joanna and Ingrid offered to the, to the market was absorbed by the immediacy of the market order by Frank. Okay, so we have also to have in mind what we learned from the, from the, from the previous session that market orders absorb liquidity, whereas limit orders offer liquidity. And then we have market makers, which uh, are always creating market around the current price, and this would explain uh, the higher number of, uh, of liquidity uh, very close to, to the current price. Okay, simply by market makers, market makers in a, in a more uh, generic term, not only um, broker dealers as we as we may think about. But also uh, proprietary trading firms, for example, who uh, exploit um, arbitrage um, arbitrage situations. For example, they are uh, also creating creating market, putting uh, a bid in one market, an ask in another in another uh, market, and, and thereby offering um, offering liquidity to 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 the to the overall market play, okay? So market makers usually are, uh, have their, their orders very close to current price because that's their, their business is, uh, is, creating, is creating market, okay? So this would be an idealized, an idealized model. And the pending interest, you see, it decreases. Uh, uh, the, the more uh, far uh, away is the, uh, the price from the current price. Okay, so we see a little bit uh, more pending orders here at 1.7 1, 1. because it's a round number. Being a round number, they are they are more um, there's a tendency to 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 accumulate more more pending orders. But usually the the the, the normal distribution or the frequent distribution would would look like uh, like this. Okay, so. What happens with the, with the impact of uh, of an order? Let's think about the order from um, from Frank, um, who uh, wants us to buy uh, 70 contracts. I put here 70; it was 75 in the, in the example before. Uh, don't care. It's, it's, uh, we are counting with a 
with the same with the same uh, the same example. Let's imagine that uh, Frank uh, buys or uh, at market those those 70 contracts, and let's forget let's forget now um, the uh, the example with uh, with Johanna and Ingrid. Just think about the liquidity that that is being offered here. So, for instance, we have here at 165 we have like 20 20 contracts. 20 contracts here at 66, uh, 18, 15 at 167, and so on. So it, when um, an order to buy at market 70 contracts would observe all these contracts, 25 here, 18, 15 here, 10, 2, 5, uh, and all these contracts would sum uh, 70, which is the, the, um, the whole uh, market order placed by, placed by Frank, right? And immediately, this is how the distribution uh, in the in the market would look like in the exact moment where this big order impacts the market. Okay, there is um, uh, it, uh, an erase of all or observing all the pending orders are observed through this uh, through this uh, order, and we have current price um, switching to the midpoint between the next available. Uh, uh, ask price at 171 and uh, the, the previous uh, the previous 164 which, which was the, the best uh, bid the higher bid okay so immediately after uh, the order is placed we have this this huge uh, gap we have this this uh, um, average current price which is average price uh, at which uh, Frank could enter is uh, his order. And um, we see how also um, we see also that Frank um, suffers from one thing, which is called lippage, right? In order to to enter this this big uh, order, he uh, suffers a lot of a lot of uh, lippage. Okay. Now, the very moment after. The, this or this big order impacts the market. We have the following situation: the market makers move their best bid to 170. Okay, close. The current price moves between 71 and uh, and 70. Okay, and uh, the later interest starts to uh, accumulate at uh, at lower. Lower prices, but uh, there is still no no pending no pending uh, orders since they they were all observed and there is still no time to to program this uh, this order. So uh, think of late, later interest simply the the interest of people in uh, in in uh, in buying at at lower levels. But um, this situation here is just a fraction. Uh, of uh, of second after the the order hit the market, so there's still no no time for these pending orders to to um, to be programmed into the market. So the probability here is for a big a big move in the opposite in the opposite direction. Okay, like like we said, the uh, the probability is always in the direction where there is uh, less. Uh, liquidity, right? Where there is uh, there is less liquidity um, uh, being being offered, and since we had this liquidity vacuum uh, left behind by this by this uh, market order, the probability for a move in the opposite direction to the order and beyond the, the initial point where the order uh, started is uh, very high. Is very high. And this may explain certain movements we see on the chart, and uh, um, which um, apparently we may see a huge candle running into a, a target level. And uh, because we see this huge candle, we may think that beyond this candle there is a lot of a lot of volume. But the fact is that candle doesn't. Show us the liquidity which is which is behind. If we could dissect a candle 
and see the different liquidity that is being offered at each price point, we would probably see that the, the candle would uh, have a lot of holes in it, a lot of vacuum in it. This is something that um, I can remember from my beginning in the uh, in trading that when I saw a big a big candle, um, I was more prone to to believe that there was a strong a strong movement behind a strong reason to go with that movement, and I was not able to think because I had I. Uh, the, the knowledge of it was not there to to think in terms of order flow and imagine that behind that candle there is simply a liquidity gap and that the probability of a movement in the against that movement is was very very high. Okay. So we have explained uh, through the impact of big orders that the price move probability is inversely, uh, inversely correlated to, uh, to the liquidity uh, available. This also means that a resistance or support becomes weaker when it is tested uh, several times. Okay, um, there is, for instance, a false uh, myth among. Uh, fraction years of technical analysis, which says that the more a level will be tested, the stronger it becomes, the stronger this level uh, becomes. And this is um, something that was transmitted wrongly. At some point, uh, someone changed the meaning of this uh, reasoning. The reasoning is the more a level is tested, a resistance or a support, the, the weaker it becomes. What becomes stronger is the likelihood for an ancient movement to, to be of a, a big magnitude, but not the level itself, because a level that is, which is tested several times, it just consumes the liquidity available at that level. It's like in the fish market, if, if we find buyers wanting to buy at the best available um, the best available ask price the fish being sold there becomes less and less right less and less so the probability of a move higher becomes higher the more that level is being uh, uh, negotiated right so back to the to the example here so um what ha what really happens with uh, with uh, with slip ups? Okay. The, ma the, ma the market mechanics and the distribution of liquidity really is telling us that there is an upward limit on the amount of money that can chase an opportunity. Right? If the order is too big, it will create a lot of a lot of uh, slip ups. So the larger uh, once account balance is, the larger um, is also the inefficiency needed to produce a, meaning, a meaningful profit because of slippage. So how do big players avoid avoid being um, suffering through through what is uh, known as, uh, as slippage? And here we have to introduce uh, another uh, concept, another type of order, which the which are the, the stop orders, and also start thinking about about what is um, what is mean by by price cascades or, or or stop cascades. Imagine we start with the same with the same situation, and I will uh, round up here very very fast in these uh, these last uh, points of the presentation, since this is the will be the core point of uh, of the next uh, sessions on the on the matter. Imagine we start with the uh, with the same situation and. We have Frank entering his, his uh, market order at the, at the same price at 165, but he knows that at 170, because it is a round number, there are also stop orders clustered clustered at that level. Okay, stop orders above current price 
means that these orders are orders from sellers liquidating their position. If a seller liquidates a position, means he's using buy order, right? Buy order. Because he sold, so in order to liquidate, he has to buy back, okay? In order to liquidate a position. So this stop orders, which Frank identified or estimated to be at 170, okay, where stop orders buy stop loss orders, okay? And stop loss, uh, stop loss orders um, have the peculiarity which is they offer liquidity to the market in the sense that they act like a limit order. They are attached to a specific price. But once the price hits, the market hits that price, that order becomes a market order. It is executed at the best available price. Uh, it, it is uh, used for immediacy. You want to get out of the market at that price. Uh, using a type of order which enable you to get out of the market at the best available at the best available price. We may think of, of stop orders as being executed or guaranteed at the same price. This will depend on the market maker you work with, but in in the, uh, in the whole in the in, in the market as as such, a, a a stop loss order will be executed at the best available price. So if Frank knows that at that level are stop buy orders sitting, he may use this knowledge to avoid slippage because those stop, lo stop uh, loss uh, orders, once the market hits that price, they will transform into buy orders, buy market order. And what does a market order? A market order observes liquidity, right? Observes liquidity. And which liquidity does a market buy order observes? The next available ask. The next, the next available offer, right? Like uh, in the fish market, okay? So here, Frank is counting with the fact that once the market hits the 170 because of the huge impact with this big order, he expects that from that point on, the these market orders in the form of, of uh, stops will start eating up all the available liquidity from people wanting to sell at this at this level. And here is where Frank might go into the market and place a limit sell order for, let's say, five contracts at 170. What he is reaching with this is that by placing a limit order, a limit sell, that limit sell of five contracts will be observed with one of the stop loss orders. And this will give him the, uh, the opportunity to close Partially, his position at a very advantageous price, without cause, without suffering from the the sleeper. Okay, right. We will see more in detail. Um, we'll see more in detail what uh, what uh, Frank has done with with the with the knowledge about of uh, lost orders, and we'll see also what happens with the with stop cascade. But right now, just to finish this, this session, we'll look into a price chart where we'll see uh, how this uh, market order created uh, uh, this movement from 165 up to 70, where the uh, these stop orders uh, are triggered and observed. The, the limit orders above 170, perhaps 71, 70, 72, and then reverse sharply back through that liquidity liquidity uh, vacuum that was created by the big order. And here we have a pattern which on the intraday is, um, is purely based on order flow, and uh, it doesn't 
um, it doesn't make a lot of sense being to speak here of an evening star and about bulls and beards and the psychology of one or the other because there is no such aspect in, 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 in the price dynamic. Okay? The same as, uh, as in, in our indicator and the patterns that may derive from, from that indicator. Here on the right side, we have the RSI on a lower time frame and how that would look like uh, from a mega overbought, overbought uh, situation from a market below below 30 in a very short time above 70, uh, a little bit of back and fill, uh, those those stop orders eating the liquidity and back below the the medium level. Okay, so you see the point with this session uh, is that a lot of price patterns can be explained through order flow and uh, which offers uh, a new dimension into, um, into price dynamics. I hope you, you want, uh, um, learned something new with this session. We will continue um, a little bit more in detail in the next uh, Cremant session. And uh, if you have any questions, I don't know if we have any minutes left to answer some uh, questions. Gabriel ask, uh, can you repeat what you said before about the candle being bigger? It means bigger probability of reverse against it. If a, a big candle is closed by a big order which uh, eats up a lot of available liquidity, this big candle will leave behind a vacuum of orders. And since the probability of price to move is in the direction where there is less less liquidity being offered if that big candle uh, has um, left behind a, a liquidity vacuum the probability of a move against it initially is very high different thing is that if a big candle is made with uh, uh, with a lot of uh, um, a, a, lo a lot of liquidity to observe and there is and it doesn't create a vacuum in liquidity. Then you have a continuation probably. Uh, uh, Boyki, uh, what were you taught and by who? I mentioned it in the beginning uh, that this work is based on the works of Egon Goldschmidt, Richard Olden and Augustine Silvani. Okay. Uh, G, 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 sorry, I uh, didn't understand. Latent interest. Latent interest means um, if simply if you want to buy or sell at a certain price level, but you haven't yet entered any order. You, are, you, you simply, you are there simply um, waiting to see price approach at level in order to take a decision where to use stop order or where to use a limit order, or where to use a market order. You have just the interest. You are following the market and have this, this uh, latent interest. This, we, we try to use this latent interest in our um, current positions table, which uh, you can you can uh, watch at FX Street. We, we enter different types of, of orders uh, being used by our dedicated contributors, and some of them are just latent interest. Just mean that big candles mean uh, mean reverse. There is a uh, a big a big probability, yes, that a, uh, a big order or a, a candle, a big candle caused by a big order in a low uh, uh, low um, liquidity situation may see its price uh, action reverse. Yes. How do we know whether a big candle uh, has left a vacuum behind? Well, um, there is since we we don't have a um, a means to to know how how much liquidity is being offered at a certain pr price. We have to start making some inferences, and this um, is is too difficult to to, to we have don't, don't have the time to to enter into that. But here we will have to uh, start thinking of the the timing. Where this, <coughs> when these, um, these large candles occur and what, at what level. 
and start making inferences from uh, um, uh, knowing what the majority of other market participants do in a certain situation. Then we can, we can start making inferences uh, about the, the, the amount of liquidity being, being offered. But to start with, we can simply um, um, avoid entering the market after such a move. That is, uh, I think that is a, it's a, it's a huge improvement in your trading because you wouldn't put yourself in a situation of, uh, of an unknown risk entering the market after, after a very big, big move, or at least not with a, not with a, with a market order, right? Uh, so you said a big candle would mean reversal only if there was less liquidity. Exactly. exactly. Otherwise, we would have a continuation movement. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Just to clarify, you just said that if we have a downturn, let's say, and then we have a big bullish candle, we have a bigger probability of prices uh, going up that way. Uh, no, the probability is, is, is in direction of the last uh, strong movement. So if we have a downtrend and we have a big bullish candle, the probability is of a down move in this case. And um, this, this could be technically um, explained through um, the hidden diver divergences, for example, the, con the concept of uh, hidden divergences, which we have talked about. Uh, that is also Mr. Sunil Pangani, who explained quite well about uh, uh, hidden divergences. I would look into his material uh, at a text bit. Um, it's like a he explains it like a rubber band. You, you have a you have a, 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 a trend that continue, uh, continues move in one direction. Suddenly, you have you have a very sharp movement against that, that trend and he, he sees that like a rubber band that you that you bend and, and then uh, which you, you can profit to enter into in the direction of uh, of the of the the main uh, prevailing uh, trend but the explanation from our model would be that you have a we have a, a, a trend in this case a downtrend for example you have a very sharp very sharp uh, rise and that, that very sharp price prob probably has left a, a vacuum behind. So that would be that vacuum would be would be then uh, uh, filled if if someone sells at that moment. If anyone sells at that moment, that uh, that selling would observe which buyers, which buyers would observe. The buyers are are at the very bottom, right? Because they were observed. Through that huge channel. Okay. If that is a continuation move or not, is or if that would lead to a continuation of the trend, is uh, it's it's uh, it's the next thought. But initially, the probability of a move in the direction of the of uh, of the prevailing trend is big because you have the trend with many sellers wanting to join that that uh, that downtrend, and then you have a lack of buyers created by that big order. Uh, where you can find that concept. I would start perhaps downloading uh, Richard Olden's uh, How to Trade booklet from our educational section. Um, here you can start having a, a good idea of how orders are are placed and about timings and how to react to, to the price action. And then uh, these other two um, authors I mentioned here are quite Quite interesting, also not to say very interesting. Uh, no, it isn't. It's a self uh, self published book. We don't have it uh, yet. Uh, perhaps we could add it to to our list. Yet. Mm -hmm. All right. So perhaps we have to to, to close the the session here. I thank you very much for for your uh, attention for your participation. Hope uh, uh, you can uh, through the reading of uh, of uh, the these uh, references you can learn a little bit more of uh, about order flow and and uh, 
the mechanics of price change. Have a great week, and uh, talk to you soon. Bye.